Well, good evening and welcome to Yada Yada. It's my pleasure to be with you. We have uh, Kirk here and uh, James. Uh, good evening, guys. Good evening. How's it going? Good. Uh, I understand that after we spent a considerable uh, time uh, discussing the fact that there's 92 million Americans that are uh, legally being prescribed uh, opiate-based uh, painkillers. Uh, that does not include all other forms of painkillers. Uh, nor does it uh, include uh, heroin and uh, fentanyl, nor does it include any of the mind-altering uh, drugs, uh, anti-anxiety and antidepressant drugs that are being prescribed. That 60 Minutes uh, did a show on it, and uh, and 60 Minutes' take on it was different than mine. Mine was, mm -hmm. if you've got 92 million of, uh, of your countrymen, and maybe twice that uh, when you look at illicit drugs, uh, drinking to excess, and the... Uh, mind-altering drugs, uh, that the problem isn't the supply. The problem is the hopeless mindset of the user, the lack of judgment uh, among the users. But 60 Minutes, uh, no, that, according to 60 Minutes, the problem is that the drug companies are greedy and that politicians are, uh, are scheming yeah, are, are scheming and uh, and. Uh, just the bad news bears. Isn't that basically the 60 minute story? That's that's pretty much it. And and they they've stopped uh, the prosecution of the distributors who uh, are the kind of go between between the manufacturers and the doctors and the pain clinics. I mean, yeah. They, yeah. There was a bit of legislation, I under, as I understand it, that mm -hmm. uh, that um, precluded something that was not going very well in the first place. Uh, the government had uh, um, set up a requirement for. Uh, um, for uh, the manufacturers of uh, of these um, mind altering and pain killing drugs uh, that people get hooked on, to um, uh, self police uh, uh, to uh, to reveal if there is an it was an abnormally high uh, amount of drugs being sent to a uh, a small pharmacy in a small mm -hmm. urban area. Uh, where they where they had a high propensity to order the highest dosages, which would indicate that it's being set up as uh, for illegal uh, illicit use, sure. and uh, and they had not been very successful in prosecuting uh, that. But uh, a politician uh, and politicians do things for bribes. I guess we found out that Hillary Clinton this week did in fact receive 150 million dollars for giving the Russians access to uh, America's uh, uranium reserves. Uh, politicians do a lot of things for bribes, and there was a, a politician, the 60 Minutes uh, singled out, who uh, uh, did away with that legislation uh, signed by Obama uh, that uh, essentially gave the drug companies carte blanche to drug as many people as wanted to be drugged. Mm -hmm. Is that was that basically the story? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, his, and his payoff was, of yeah. course. Of course, he became yeah, the, drug, the drug jaw. Yeah, he uh, became. Czar. He was nominated as the drug czar. That's just perfect. By, by uh, it's just like you know, well like done. the CIA and the FBI uh, uh, prosecuting um, uh, drug distributors when they, in fact, are the largest drug distributor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> America, you know, and that's, what that's really America. amazing is, you know, the uh, the largest uh, uh, single uh, concentration of um, of prescription drugs in terms of the of who receives them and why they are given. You know what the the largest culprit is uh, by far? Military, uh, and uh, it'd be the U.S. military with their yeah, uh, uh, with their uh, the drugs they've been given out for post traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, yeah. Six hundred and fifty thousand Americans. <laughs> Pretty staggering. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to reemphasize this point, and, and it seems like all of America, in terms of the media, has lost its collective mind. Uh, incapable of thinking. You know, they, they want to have a conniption fit over the Russians for uh, for influencing our elections when all they can find that the Russians did was buy uh, ads on Facebook that directed people to fake news stories. So if you can throw an election by presenting fake news in social media, the problem isn't the ad. The problem isn't the fake news. The problem isn't the institution buying the fake news. It's that your it's population is too stupid to vote. They're idiots. 
And if you have manufactured that many idiots, your educational system is an absolute disgrace and counterproductive. Duke. That's the problem. The same thing is true with the uh, with having 92 or 93 million people being prescribed opiate uh, pain uh, killers. It's the problem is with the end user. They they to take these kind of drugs, you're crazy. Particularly mm-hmm. since you know, in, in terms of painkillers, there are so many better options. You know, I I occasionally get, uh, you know, I'm an older guy, so if I'm working outside on an even services carrying loads, I'm likely to uh, to strain the ligaments in my knees, and they get inflamed, and you get you know a thing that's called bursitis, and it is really painful. I mean, there are times where you stand up and you just want to scream. I mean, it's really painful, and uh, you know, there's lots of ways to deal with it. But the drugs is uh, is about the worst of those options. The, you know, the best option is exercise, particular types of exercise, discipline to it, uh, losing weight, and uh, and physical therapy. Right. Why is it the people the painkillers pain? do not do anything to get rid of pain? They just deaden the no. brain sensors that re- that interpret right. pain. It right. doesn't get rid of the pain. It doesn't heal at all. Now there right. are uses for it. You know, if you're having surgery. A certain level of painkillers are necessary. Well, they're, they're, but, you know, I've, I've had surgery, and I'll tell you, the only kind of painkillers uh, that I think are necessary is you need to be put out during the surgery. Yeah, anesthesia. But, yeah, but once you wake up, unless it's cancer surgery and they've just torn you to ribbons, you're really better off without the pain medication. Even Tylenol, so you're better off without it. It's addictive. I mess you up big time. Uh, there was a uh, program last night on, I think it was PBS, on uh, on um, uh, the uh, air marshal for uh, Hitler, Goring. And uh, he um, was badly injured when he was a young man, and uh, they uh, prescribed him uh, morphine. And he became a morphine addict. Never was able to shake it. He was a drug addict all of the rest of his life. Uh, it's just there's some things you just can't do. They're addictive. Don't do it. You know, over the short term. And uh, and you know sometimes you just got to deal with pain. It's not the end of the world. Uh, Kirk, you told me that uh, that uh, they found the guy that set those uh, horrible fires where 41 people at least died and billions of dollars of damage were uh, was done. Mm-hmm. Whole communities wiped out. What was his name? Yeah, they arrested him. Uh-huh. He's the, what was his uh, name? His name is uh, Jesus Gonzalez. Okay, so he's Jesus a, has a, returned, and uh, he's uh, burned down uh, in Northern California. Is that the gist of the story? <laughs> yeah. Well, certainly is Jesus is here. Alien living in a sanctuary yeah, Jesus is here in part of California, down, yeah. Northern California. I thought I'd share with you the, uh, a passage that I've translated the last couple of, uh, of days. Uh, well, actually, the last couple of days I've actually been working in the Day of Midian. Um, who would have thought I would ever be telling the story of the Day of Midian? But it was, it was among the most interesting stories I have ever had the pleasure of, uh, of translating. We'll get into it uh, one day. It's in the 17th chapter of observations. But this is the uh, the sixth, or excuse me, the ninth chapter of Yashaya. Now, everyone thinks the last chapter of Yashaya, you know, uh, uh, the child is born, a son is given. Mm-hmm. And so they think, well, it's talking about Jesus. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Let me, uh, let me share with you a little, just the, uh, we'll, and then we'll return to where we were previously. It says, <clears throat> nevertheless, now, if the first word of the first sentence in a chapter is "nevertheless," you didn't, <laughs> you didn't start you didn't start your chapter in the right place. <laughs> just, just as a hint, there you did not chap- you did not start your chapter in the right place if the first word is "nevertheless." And that was my first point as I was writing this chapter: is that uh, uh, nine one and the uh, and the message of chapter eight is one continuous story. Anyway, nevertheless, there will be no sadness or gloomy darkness for those who are subjugated and oppressed. This, for her, is in contrast to the previous time, when he receded from the land of uh, Zebulun and the land of 
Naphtali. You know what the land of uh, guys. You know what the land of uh, of Zebulun and Naphtali are. What those represent? Yeah, those are the two uh, tribes. Um. Yeah, yeah, two of two of the tribes. They happen to be uh, uh, northernmost tribes. Uh, one of them is uh, is the kind of the doorway of where uh, uh, Gentile warring Gentile nations have always uh, entered uh, Israel. Uh, that would be in the Nephali, and the uh, uh, Zebulun is a is a tiny little uh, landlocked tribe that's uh, right at the heart, uh, kind of uh, between the the uh, the mountains and the sea. That uh, the um, warring armies, when they would invade Israel, that's where they would come through. So anyway, those those were the two uh, tribes that he mentioned. So uh, God is, began just by, nevertheless, the sadness or gloomy darkness for those who were subjugated and oppressed. Uh, this, uh, for her, is in contrast to the previous time when he receded from, withdrew from, the land of Zebulun and Nephali. And then at a later time following that, he will severely and harshly deal with the stubborn and irrational, troublesome nature and pretentious, vehemently oppressive nature of the way of the sea. Now, that would be, of course, um, Gentiles. Gentiles, right? Mm-hmm. Then it goes on to say, uh, on the opposing side of the Yarden, so outside of Israel, serving as an open doorway and pivot point for the socio-political realm of the Gentile nations. Now, that's fairly interesting statement because if that's 9-1 we aren't talking about 2,000 years ago are we? No. Because Yahweh has not harshly dealt with the irrational troublesome pretentious vehemently oppressive nature of those on the opposing sides of the Arden the social political realm of the Gentile nations but he's going to by the way, that also says I'm going to hold them accountable. And since the Christian Church is a Gentile organization, a style organization, yeah, I'd be really concerned if I were them. The family of related people who have walked in the darkness and in error will see for a finite time an appearance of a great and expansive light. Those who have lived in the realm of foreboding darkness and in the shadow of death, a light will shine on them. Now, I want to ask you guys. 2,000 years ago, starting around uh, 2 BCE and running through uh, 33 CE, <coughs> did um, Yosha appear as light? Well, his words did. No. Did appear as light? No. no. Yeah, the uh, answer we're... is absolutely not. You know, there's no. a quick story that's only attested uh, in one of the books that uh, he went to the Mount of Transfiguration and, and briefly was uh, transfigured there. I don't know if the story's credible or not, but uh, if that happened, three people saw him. No, he wasn't wretched so, at all. No. Yeah, this absolutely is not speaking of that. No. So he did not come as light, did he? No. Came, you know, in spirit and flesh and bone, but not as light. So we're not talking about what happened in, uh, uh, 2,000 years ago. So they did not see an appearance of a great and expansive light. However, how was he returning? Yom Kippurim, same way. Yeah, as, as, yeah. Yep. Yeah, as as exactly. So we're, yeah. we're not talking about what was. We're talking about what will be once again. The family of related people, Am, so we're talking about Yisrael, who have walked in the darkness and air, will see for a finite period of time the great and expansive light. You have improved and prolonged the lives of a number of those from different races and places, increasingly uh, nurturing their joy. Cheerfully, they rejoice in your presence, before your appearance, similar to the jubilation during the ingathering of a harvest, just as they will be ecstatic when they share the spoil, apportioning the property and possessions they have gained. All right. 
I would ask you, when Yosha appeared 2,000 years ago, were there any goyim who were uh, prolonged, enriched, nurtured, joyful, witnessing a harvest, or sharing in a spoil? No. No. So we've got to go forward now, 2,000 years from that, about uh, 16 years on our time clock. We've got to go forward to uh, 2033, to Yom Kippurim, don't we? Mm-hmm. And then we're going to find, and I'm not sure we're going to find any outside of our company, but yeah, well, we'll find uh, some uh, people from different races and places, some Goy, whose lives he has improved and prolonged whose lives are now more joyous. And cheerfully, they're going to rejoice in Yahweh's presence, similar to the jubilation of the ingathering during the harvest. (laughs) Because at this time, we will be anywhere from six to seven years away from our joy uh, during the harvest. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be ecstatic because... And, you know, I was originally kind of a little concerned that the word for here is spoil. But that's exactly what's happening. You know, when you have a spoil of war, what happens is that you defeat somebody and you take what they have, right? Yeah. yeah. Spoil of war. Take the souls back. Yeah. Well, what we're going to find is what Yao was taking, uh, talking about here, is uh, he's going to obliterate every military and going to turn these the people just going to incinerate them with his light. And we are going to inherit the world that they once controlled. Yep. And so we are getting a spoil. And the spoil we're getting happens to be the earth reconfigured into the conditions found during the uh, the Garden of Eden. And it's going to be fun. So uh, that's what he's uh, talking about here. Uh, and that's only going to occur in the future. For indeed, you have cast away the yoke of his economic burden from his back along with the means to extend the reach and influence of the ruling authorities wielding a staff, a scepter, or a spear. A staff would mean religious people, a scepter, political people, or a spear, those in the military, with regard to those who would strive to exploit him, exerting their influence over him to control the masses and tax them, subjecting them to under undue pressures to submit and comply. So he's getting, we're witnessing Yahweh removing economic control and influence, political, religious, and uh, and uh, uh, military. Mm-hmm. That hasn't happened thus far. Going to happen. So similar to the day of Midian, how many of you really know what happened on the day of Midian and why? You know what happened on the day of Midian? Midian was the, the Midianites were pretty uh, good dudes. You know, um, who did Moshe go off and meet with after he fled Egypt? Well, you yeah, know, that's the Midianites too. Who, yeah, who uh, who gave him the uh, the sheep that he could tend to? Who gave him uh, the uh, the daughter of the uh, the king? Who took them into uh, their company? Is Midian, mm-hmm. right? And where were the Midianites? You have any idea where they were located? In Arabia, near Arabia. Yeah, right there in, uh, in the uh, foothills of uh, Mount Horeb. <clears throat> well, the Midianites didn't stay congenial. They uh, became extraordinarily evil, and they hooked up uh, Kirk with your favorite people. The Amalekites. Okay. <laughs> they did, they did indeed, and yeah. uh, and they also uh, partnered with uh, Babel. They call yeah. them the uh, the sons of the east, or the sons of the east, as explained in uh, Barishith, as uh, those that uh, built uh, Babel. And collectively, they were coming in to destroy Israel. They would come in, and as you, you know, you should share the story. They. Uh, uh, they came in like locusts, and they devoured everything. And they would come in right at the harvest and and take 
uh, everything that was uh, valuable and destroy what they didn't want to carry out or eat. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, one day uh, it, it came to pass that they decided, you know, eh, we've toyed with them enough, we've uh, terrorized them enough, we'll just wipe them out. And they came in with this huge, massive army. And, uh, yeah, we well, found uh, this uh, fellow uh, Gideon. Gideon. In a, in a wine press. Uh, you, know, you know what he was doing in the wine press? He was making his last meal or something. I can't remember. Yeah, he was, uh, he, was grinding, he was grinding grain in a wine press because he felt that if I'm doing this in a wine press, <laughs> they won't find they it. Won't they, won't find com- they, won't, they won't confiscate <laughs> it. <laughs> and the conversations with uh, with Gideon are just priceless. Uh, you know, everybody that God finds, and, you know, I guess there just <laughs> there just really aren't a lot of good people to work with. But uh, God decided, you know, I'm going to work with this one guy, you alone. With you, I'm going to save Israel. He said, you alone. And uh, and the way that, that God works with uh, with Gideon is. Well, it's one of the great stories that I have ever read, particularly in the details, and, and we'll get to that one day. But uh, Yah was talking about, as was the day of Midian. So, uh, you know, the sixth chapter of Shaphat, Judges, uh, just presents the preamble. This is what the uh, the Amalekites, and this is what the Midians, and the Babylonians were doing. And, uh, and they were essentially destroying Israel. Uh, making it a, a place that no one could live, and so they had to be driven out for uh, for the for Israel to survive. And uh, and uh, the sixth chapter explains that and explains how God came upon Gideon <laughs> and the whole story of uh, of uh, Gideon's fleece. I mean, if you talk to a Christian, Christian about Gideon, all they're going to know about is the fleece <laughs> and the test of the fleece: do on the fleece, no on the uh, no do on the land. Uh, do on the land, no do on the feast, and it's a, the insights there are uh, are stunningly valuable, and we'll talk about that in the future. But the day of Midian then follows, where uh, you got this huge army encampment. Again, they're 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 like locusts. Um, their camels can't even be counted, and they're armed to the teeth. And do you have any idea what uh, how many people uh, Yahweh decided he would uh, take against the Midianites? Three hundred. Yeah, three hundred. And what's interesting, you know what his uh his uh he has a number of uh, of tests to because uh-huh. it starts with twenty two thousand that volunteered and God says yeah. I, I can't work. Weed it out, weed them down. Well, I, I, there is no way in the world that I'm gonna deal with twenty two thousand people. That's way too many people. Now that ought to scare the bejesus out of Christians. God saying I'm want not gonna me, deal with I'm not going to deal with 22,000 people. How is he going to deal with 3 billion? No way I'm going to deal with 22,000. Way too many people, he says. So he says, if anybody is the least bit fearful, go back to your place. Go back home. So the fear of God, (laughs) test one. If you're fearing God, you don't know him. You're out. Go away, you're out. Okay, the second test. The second test is just my absolute, absolute favorite. There was a group of people that uh, made it through the. Uh, that, by the way, the first text uh, took it uh, down to uh, to ten thousand. And then uh, the there was a second test, and in the second test, um, God just said about the water. And they're drinking water. Yeah, that's the third test, actually, I think. Uh, oh, the third, second okay. test is, God just makes it real clear. It says, um, uh, I, want, I want to tell you who I want and who I don't want. And if I say I don't want them, I don't, you are not to go forward with them. If I say I do want them, they're to be included. Is that clear? I want who I want, and I don't want to those who I don't want. Now, that part was just riveting because... You know, we've uh, we've came to this conclusion that no one comes to know God unless he introduces himself first. While it is technically possible, it is so difficult with societal indoc- uh, indoctrination on you know the, the Torah being mm-hmm. arcane, obsolete, mean spirited, you know, from a wrathful God uh, being replaced, whatever it might be. 
that the likelihood somebody's going to go there and then take the time to translate it so they can understand what God said. It is so enormously remote that if God didn't intervene and introduce himself first, chances are no one would have known him. So what God is saying is, you know, it's my universe. It's my house. Don't you think I get to choose who I want to spend? Yeah, who I want in my home, who I want to be a part of. I don't get to choose who I adopt. I mean, come on. Think it through, people. So this idea that, that we choose God is nonsense. God chooses who he wants to be with. Now, the fact that he chooses what he, who he wants to be with doesn't preclude our free will at all, because what we do next, how we respond to him, is completely up to us. But the first choice is God's. He chooses. Man doesn't choose. Man... Who's an arrogant man to say, yeah, well, yeah, you can choose to be with God. No, you can't. Now, then the next test. Uh, Kirk, you just uh, got a, a new puppy dog, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, you really like dogs? I love, yeah, we love dogs. Uh, puppies are, 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 are work in progress. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> uh, so those that God chose to accept did what? They well, lapped they up the water planet. with their tongues like dogs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, why do you think God said, these are the ones that I want? They lapped up water like a dog. Maybe it's to tell us that, you know, if you can look at the character and the manner of a dog, and you can learn a lot. Loyal. Loving. They listen to what you have to say. They want to please you. Mm-hmm. We want to be part well, of the family. We'll need it. to protect the family. We want to spend all day with you, given the opportunity. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd take another take on it. It's because they were looking up and observing while they were drinking. Well, Their focus was. Well, the, the ones that he rejected, which were you know, 90-some-odd percent of those who he had already not sent home, those he rejected were bowing down, getting down on their knees. Right. If you're bowing down, God does not want you. That's an amazing story. So if you're bowing down, God wow. does not want you. Yeah, it's really telling the uh, the whole story. So then, yeah, they go with 300. So you know what? With the uh, the weapons that they brought to bear against the uh, the Midianites and the uh, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, uh, assembled warriors down there, there were too numerous to count what the 300 uh, representatives of Israel took as weapons. And they had two. They had a lantern they had and, two. A, yeah, they and had a little two. Uh, knife, a short, short sword no, no, or a knife. Nope, 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 nope. No? In fact, a sword never appears in the story. It's translated sword oh, twice, but a sword never thing. appears in the story. Yep. No, they, uh, they had two things, one in the right hand, one in the left hand. In the right hand, they had a shofar. Uh. A shofar. Now, I mean, I guess... If you're really bad at playing the thing, you can kill somebody. <laughs> at least to the point they'd want to die. You heard it, you <laughs> you hear it? Okay, but a shofar far. is a ram's horn uh, trumpet. A trumpet made out of a ram's horn. They blew the trumpet. Okay, so that was that was weapon number one. Was they blew the trumpet at them? That was in the right hand. You know, was their left hand? I thought it was uh, equivalent of a tea, yeah, equivalent of a tiki torch. They took uh, some uh, empty jars uh, and they put some flax in them. They doused the flax with olive oil and they lit it on fire. <laughs> Those were their weapons. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> uh, by the was way, they didn't throw the, uh, those, yeah, they did not throw them like their Molotov cocktails. They didn't burn the the camp down. They, in fact, they took their lanterns and they shattered them, and they took the trumpets and they blew them. And the Midianites and uh, and all of those gathered with them uh, fled, and then Yahweh yeah, destroyed them. That's the uh, that's the story. And so, what's the day of Midian? It's a uh, the people when people listen to God, even when it's an extremely small number of people listen to God and uh, respond to what He is asking them to do. 
Yahweh not only protects them and protects their home and drives uh, those who are evil and uh, and destructive away from their home, Yahweh obliterates those involved in the military. Well, that was in Chapter 16 too that we but uh, that we were reading this week. As uh, you know, if you trust God, you don't need weapons. You don't need anything. And that's, and that's, that's the story of the day of Midian. So this reads, So similar to the day of Midian, surely, since every boot worn by the trampling soldiers of marching armies is part of the commotion and clamor of battle, the staccato percussion of weapons, and the fearful response to it all, along with the clothing which is befouled by wallowing in blood, they shall come to exist as fuel, to be burned up in the fire, a blazing light. Now we'd always thought that the story in Zechariah where you know yeah, it turns him to ooze and Malachi. You know when he comes back, he's so bright that everybody just vaporizes. That, no, uh, no. Yeah, that's not, not uh, covered in the uh, the garment of light and the set apart uh, spirit. But uh, uh, in fact, right here in Yashaya nine five, the statement immediately before the most quoted Old Testament prophecy God is saying when when I return I'm going to obliterate my light is going to obliterate it's going to incinerate all of the armies of the world now that's going to happen on his return but it's also a confirmation of what the return is going to be all about it's uh we don't have God supporting our troops we've got obliterating them uh, so I just thought that was fabulous. By the way, there is a one other little insight in the, it was a ton of insights in it, but one of my favorites is that when Gideon finally uh, uh, was uh, starting to listen to God and he uh, he did his test. Do you know how God equipped him to uh, to be the one person who could uh, save Israel? No. Yeah, uh, you would never find it if you're reading an English translation. Because it would say it says that the spirit came upon him, but that's not what the uh, the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says the spirit adorned him, and the word for adorn uh, means adorned him in a brilliant white garment. It's the thing we've been saying for years now. The set apart spirit prepares us by adorning us in her garment of light. Right there in the middle of Shaphat and the uh, the uh, judge's story of the day of uh, of Midian. So lots of interesting things, and, and then from there, you know, well, then we have that famous uh, passage. But what God is doing now, it's obvious since He's been talking about the end, is He's telescoping time, which is mm-hmm. His perspective on time. To telescope time means He just bring all time together. I was going to tell you the whole story in a uh, in a snapshot. Where, uh, you, where there is no depth of field anymore, I'm going to tell. I'm going to telescope time, bringing it all together. And he says, "For indeed, a child is born." Now, the child is from Yalad. Child is Yaled, and born is Yalad. Same word, just the noun and verb form. He is conceived and brought forth through a pregnant woman. Boy, that's rare. <laughs> that hasn't <laughs> happened very often, has it? For indeed, a Young boy, a child, young boy, uh, from infant to young man, is born. By the way, that would be lowercase child, lowercase he in talking about him. It's just a child was born. To us, a son is given. Nathan is produced and provided, appointed and set in place, is bestowed. So... uh, Written, by the way, that was written in the Nephil Passive. The subject, the son, carries out the appointment uh, as he becomes the gift passively in both uh, for both over a finite period of time. And the power to engage and endure, this is Misra. Misra is the means to empowerment and liberation. Uh, it means the ability to persist and perceive. You know what uh, this um, word is from? It's from Sarah. 
Sarah means to Sarah is the you know the name that sits at the heart of Israel is Yish Sarah El, and uh, it is also the name of the mother of uh, of the covenant. It means to persist, pr- persevere, endure, engage, contend. Um, so, if you look at every English translation, it says the government shall be on his shoulders. Well, there is nothing that is government related about Sarah and. Miss Sarah can't mean government. So it's the power to engage and endure. She'll be upon his shoulder. She'll exist upon his shoulder. Well, you know, Yahweh through Yosha accomplished that on Pesach. And his name shall be called out Wonderful Counselor. Did um, Yosha ever claim to be the Wonderful Counselor? No, like Yahweh doesn't even. Yeah, Yahweh doesn't even uh, say he's the wonderful counselor, except when he, he's listing the seven spirits of Yahweh. Uh, the wonderful counselor is the set apart spirit. So now we have a reference to the Son on Pesach, and we have a reference to the set apart spirit. Wonderful, amazing advice, if you will, and then Almighty God. That doesn't apply to the set-apart spirit or the Son, Yosha, because this is the totality of God. Eternal Father, the Son was not the Father, obviously. Eternal Father. And then the last, it says uh, the Prince, but Sar, which... You know, Sar's got a lot of definitions that would... that in English come out Prince, but the fact is that Sar is the basis of Sarah the means to empower reconciliation. So, you know, it's just, uh, you try to dig in, figure out what the words actually mean, and you uh, you try to, to understand why these references are made, and what you come up with is something so radically different than what you've been led to believe. So, uh, the Jesus that came to start the fires in Northern California ain't the right one. No. All right, let's return to uh, uh, Yashaya 5. That's in the 14th chapter of Observations, and we're on page uh, uh, 47, but I'm going to just recap uh, the statements immediately before where we are headed. It says, well, this is a warning regarding a disastrous and destructive situation which can ruin a person. So this is a cautionary tale to those who take the lead in promoting error by twisting and distorting in a boisterous and agonizing religious parade of error, futilely and vainly, promoting worthless lies about pagan gods and idolatrous images using false and empty promises. As with the ties that bind on the harness of a cart of sin, the one among them says without thinking and out of anxiety the future, he should want to hurry. I want him to swoop down and accelerate his work so that we may see it. Now, forget about God's timeline. It's I want it done on mine, and then let the counsel of the cross and painful advice of the Holy One of Israel approach and present itself, because we want to have it revealed and shown to us. Whoa, this is a warning to the one among those who call that which is evil, that which is wrong, contemptible, and malicious, good, correct, beneficial, and generous, who call that which is good, evil, who replaces that which is sweet for that which is bitter and anguishing, disagreeable and obstinate, and that which is obstinate for and pleasing and acceptable for poison which embitters through a toxic mix of obstinate rebellion. He's talking here primarily about Paul and the legacy of Paul. Mm -hmm. Whoa, this is a warning to the learned and scholarly, the crafty and cunning in their own eyes and from their own perspective, giving the impression and outward appearance of understanding, and to those making connections as a contrarian through their appearance and public persona. Whoa, this is a warning to the powerful and influential, to the politicians, the military heroes, as a result of becoming drunk by consuming wine, (laughs) or today doing all manner of drugs, becoming inebriated, 
and to individuals of nobility and wealth with regard to mingling and mixing together intoxicants, which impair judgment. Boy, has that ever happened in America. Mm -hmm. Who justly, who justify and acquit those who are wicked and evil as a quid pro quo to gain influence, thereby turning away and rejecting those who are upright and righteous, correct and vindicated from him. Boy, how many people do you think had to be bribed in one way or another for Harvey Weinstein to to assault women for 40 years? Mm. For the Clintons to uh, yeah. go on their uh, campaign of, uh, of robbing the American people. Now, the fifth and final stanza of Yahweh's song is why we uh, opened this chapter early. It's still a song to his beloved, to Dode, and it contains another warning. It is spoken against everyone who is religious or and also political, to Christians especially, having come to cherish Paul's letters. They have rejected and come to despise Yahweh's Torah. But they're not alone. Muslims believe that their Quran has replaced the Torah. Religious Jews, the liberty, have substituted their Talmud for the Torah. And socialist, secular humanists are at war with it, creating a social order that is the antithesis of what God intended through his Torah. The consequence of rejecting the Torah is to wither and rot away, according to God. Life is but a short affair from dust to dust. So why would anybody do so? Why avoid the word of God? Why would anyone treat his promises with contempt? Why belittle the Almighty? Or may I pose the question this way? Why did those who claimed to be preaching God's word despise what he had to say? That's a $64,000 question. Isn't it indeed? Therefore, then, just as a tongue of fire devours the chaff, and the scorching blaze withers the dry and combustible foliage, their roots accordingly become rotten with the stench of decay and their blossoms are like the dust which is carried away, because they have rejected and come to despise the Torah of Yahweh, of the vast array of spiritual messengers. The instructive word and promise of the set-apart one of Yisrael, they spurn, have discarded, and treat with contempt. I mean, it's staggering that man would do this to God. And so God says, you know, it's your choice, but if you're going to reject and despise my Torah, if you're going to discard and treat with contempt my instructive words and promises, uh, here's the consequence. You know, your, your survival is going to be akin to a scorching blaze that uh, burns up the chaff. It burns up the, all of the foliage. Well, we saw that in Northern California. I mean, there, those communities, there is nothing left. Burnt to nothing but but a sea of ash. Yeah. And when that happens, the roots die. They become rotten. And the blossoms are like the dust which is carried away. And the reason is they rejected the Torah. Well, There isn't a Christian on the planet that hasn't rejected the Torah. There's not a Muslim on the planet that hasn't rejected the Torah. There's not a secular humanist on the planet that hasn't rejected the Torah. And we can just go ahead and throw in, uh, just because there's a billion of them, every Hindu has rejected the Torah. Sure. Well, that would leave you, of uh, of the seven billion people on earth, at about... uh, about a billion of the seven billion who aren't part of that list. But I would dare say that if you were to look at those who would fall outside of this list, who haven't come to reject the Torah, and who haven't come to reject and despise God's promises and his uh, instructive words, you'd be down to a few hundred. I don't know if you'd find more than a few hundred. But if God is telling you specifically, this is the cause of of you being utterly destroyed, and it's that you've rejected my Torah, 
And you're lugging that around in your Christian babble. What is it? Where's the disconnect? Why aren't you saying, wait a minute? God just said that if you reject the Torah, then you're going to be incinerated. And we've got this uh, New Testament where half of it is presented as a wholesale rejection of the Torah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Particularly when he's so clear that the, the litmus test for are you with me or are you against me? Are you going to be destroyed and incinerated, your soul ceasing to exist, or are you uh, going to live, is your attitude towards the Torah, accepted or rejected. By the way, it's interesting, too. The, uh, the fire is on this side of hell. And if we may use the Christian nomenclature for Sheol, mm-hmm. uh, the fire is on this side of it. Not on the other it side. can't be in Sheol. Yeah, it can't be in Sheol. But it is the thing that uh, that serves to uh, to wipe out those that uh, will cease to exist. It's the uh, it's the crucible. It's the the fire refines. But it's on this side. Accordingly, therefore, the anger of Yahweh was aroused, and it's aroused with his people, and he stretched out and turned his hand upon them. And he struck them, hoping that they would regret what they have done. And the mountains were shaken, and so were the likeness of their corpses, which were unwanted and poised to be swept away in the midst of their streets and public places. And all of this, his animosity and displeasure, however, did not return. And so his hand is still outstretched. Well, that's really an interesting uh, presentation. We don't very often think of God striking his children. But uh, here he is. And the reason he's striking them is he's trying to awaken them from uh, just continuing to perpetrate the worst possible behavior. They're rejecting him, and they're going to die. And he's saying, wake up! And it didn't do any good. But well, well, even worse than that, they're they're going to con- perpetuate it to their children. Yes. I mean, they were they, he got nothing to lose by striking them. They're gone. All they right. can do is hang around long enough to really infect the rest of them. So right. that seems fair. Yeah, yeah. Just stop it. And but he says now my hand is still outstretched. So why would his hand still be outstretched unless it was to lift them up? Yeah. to show them a sign, to be there for them. You know, I, I tried to wake you up. It didn't work, but I'm not going anywhere. I made a promise to Abraham. I'm going to honor the promise. My hand is still outstretched. Grab hold of it if you want to uh, be lifted up. So while he was frustrated on that day, what happened is that that yeah, was you know it just doesn't do any good to be frustrated, and he, he he ran out of people that he could communicate through. So for just a very long time, well, he was still willing to lift up anybody who would willing to come to him. Um, for the most part, he withdrew. And really, the hand of Yahweh was really all that was left. The hand of Yahweh would be uh, Yosha, if you uh, if you will. So. That brings us to to uh, the realization that, you know, quite honestly, we ought to feel sorry for God. We really do. We ought to feel sorry for God, oh, yeah. especially after all He's done for His people. You know, if He had any other response to them, it would show that He didn't love them, that He no longer cared, that He had given up on them, but He didn't. Hand was still out. He still wanted to help them. So this is uh, what follows, is um, is the reason we came to this passage. What is he talking about? It says, then he will lift up a standard, serving as a banner and signal. It's from Neck. A prominent sign or an insignia, hosted high 
upon an upright pole for all to see, serving as a signal or ensign to convey important information which should be followed to bring people into the proper encampment. It's masculine singular. It's from nakak and naka, that which is anointed, set apart, prepared, designated, and authorized to serve by pouring out proof which can be tested. So then he will lift up a standard, serving as a banner and signal for the Gentile nations. So this is something that's not happening inside of Israel. No. This is not something that is that is uh, going to initially be seen by Israel. Initially, this is going to be seen by Gentiles from far away. So remote from Israel. This can't be Syria. Can't be Israel. Can't be Yehuda. Uh, can't be Egypt. Can't be Babylon, can't be the Middle East, can't be Greece, can't be Rome. From far away, Mm -hmm. a great distance away. And oh, by the way, men rakok also means in the distant future. And he will attract attention non-verbally to it from the ends of the earth. He will attract attention non-verbally is from Shirak. He will reveal the signal by drawing attention. It's used to describe the uh, uh, the piping uh, and uh, or describe piping uh, that pierces the air and penetrates the ears of a shepherd who is calling for a sheep. Mm-hmm. So he's going to attract and draw attention to it from the ends, the far extremities of the earth. That would be impossible until the last uh, 15 or 20 years. And behold, in a very brief period of time, quickly and rapidly, voiced at the speed of light, call swiftly and speedily, nimbly and agilely, moving one place to another while lightly esteemed by many, using the sound of one's voice, calling out aloud, he will come. It will come, depending on how you want to... uh, deal with the pronoun. It or he will come, dealing either with the individual who has comprised this signal or the signal itself. Bo will arrive. That's Yashia 526. What this is. So, as we consider whether there is someone else living a great distance away from Yisrael at this time, who is engaged in exposing and condemning each of the three religions which have commingled the truth and lies in their attempt to usurp credibility derived from their incredulous association with Yahweh's Torah and prophets, who is at the same time devoted to sharing Yahweh's message as it's presented in the Torah as accurately and completely as possible, who is unwavering in their dissemination of that message worldwide, on behalf of a people in many places of many races. Is anyone else considering, um, can be considered for the intent of Yashiga 5? Is there anyone else other than us as we're doing this? I think we'd be able to find them. I can't think of anything. If they were. You'd think that they would somehow be known. In fact, they, they would make themselves known to us because you know millions of people around the world google access to uh these books and these shows mm-hmm. and if somebody else was was doing the same thing they'd say you know what a pleasure it is to find somebody that knows Yahweh's name that speaks of the mikre as the as the path to camp out with god and has understands the purpose of each of them understands the terms and conditions of the covenant, understands that Torah means teaching, understand that that uh, Yosha is nothing more or less than a diminished, set-apart manifestation of Yahweh, that the spirit is set apart from Yahweh and that she has maternal characteristics. You know, you think that if somebody and else just, And just loves the Torah period. I mean, right. they reach out. 
right. Who at the same time, this, yeah, had destroyed up. Pauline Christianity, vocally yeah. and unequivocally. Who at the same time had realized that how important it is to learn Hebrew if you want to understand who God is and what He's offering. Do you think that if there's anybody who was doing any one of those things that we wouldn't have heard from them? It would be almost impossible, wouldn't it, James? Yeah. Well, I think we would have found them. Yeah, we do enough searching we, online. Oh, yeah, because I you know, I search probably 20 things online every day as a result of these translations and, uh, and commentary that I write. I'm doing it all the time. No, I don't come up with anything. Every time I put in anything that has to do with the any of the insights that we find is the first you know, ten things that are listed are our books or shows. Way. Yeah. So so no. no it's a, uh, what an honor. Yeah, so you know if you in but particular if you look at, at Yeah, at, at at this particular chapter of Yashaya, the other thing that is that is essential that I don't think anyone else is doing around the world with this We've come to recognize that the central figure, the most important person who's ever lived, is Dode. Dode. Yeah. That he is Yahweh's beloved son, that he is right, and that his psalms explain how we can join him and also be right with Yahweh, and how we can become beloved sons and daughters of Yahweh. This entire chapter is devoted to you. I was beloved to Dode. I, I think you put it best the other day when you said, you know, we have we technically have nothing from Yosha. Nothing. Uh, certainly no yeah. Hebrew writing. Yeah. No, no, not a single thing he ever said or wrote. Nothing penned right. by him. Nothing. And we have right. volumes from Dode. Vo- volumes. We have Dode uh, from, uh, th- from three different... From, oh, well. We have Dode from sources beyond compare. I mean, we have... Dode's whole life chronicled in, uh, in Chronicles and in, uh, and in uh, the Samuel and in Kings. We have all of Dode's insights and conversations with Yahweh chronicled in the Mizmor Psalms. We have Dode as the logical author of most of the Proverbs. And besides that, we've got everybody talking about Dode. Mm-hmm. Dode is all over Yashaya. In fact, in the sixth chapter, is going to be another reference to Dode. It's going to establish the kingdom of Dode. You know, Nobody when Yahweh it. returns, all the way to his return, he's going to establish the kingdom of Dode. And so... Well, ironically, though, he's the, he's the greatest source for everything about important about Yosha. Correct. Yeah, that's a really interesting. Yeah, yeah. he, Dode and Yosha are both called the branch, and yeah. uh, and uh, realistically, uh, there really is nothing. Uh, well, there's not nothing. There's surprisingly little that we can know about Yosha apart from Dode's writings, and Dode provides the the best eyewitness account of what occurred. Now, while we're speaking of Yosha here. Um, uh, because of uh, the importance of Dode. Uh, I had come to the conclusion, and, and it's now something that was underscored by uh, a, a massive edit that uh, Roy provided on, uh, I think it's Chapter 15, and I ended up rewriting a section uh, tremendously, and then Jackie provided two uh, citations from Yasha Yah, which uh, proved the point. Um, when Yosha was born... He was an ordinary kid. He was an ordinary human being, all the way up to the point where the spirit of Yahweh descended upon him in the Jordan, and Yahweh said, this is my son, who I am pleased. Prior to that, now the one thing that he had that was unique, and uh, and, uh, Roy was the one that came up with this idea, and I think he's right. When Mm -hmm. uh, Gabriel... uh, Gabriel, if you will, met with Miriam. What I think he was carrying, first I think she was pregnant and was carrying a child. But uh, you know what, uh, and uh, and the fact that he referred to himself as the son of man, it was uh, Joseph, Joseph that, uh, that 
cause her to be pregnant. What he was carrying was Yahweh's soul. And so uh, the soul of uh, Yosha was Yahweh's. But Yosha did not become the diminished manifestation of Yahweh until the Sirit descended upon him. And he ceased to be that three years later upon the upright pole of the Passover. So uh, um, the citations that uh, we found and applied to it in, uh, in Yashaya now make that, um, that conclusion unequivocal. A, uh, God wasn't born. God did not die. And for 30 of the 33 years that Yosha was here, he was not God. Now, those are some stunning implications uh, with regard to that. But uh, um, uh, we'll let that sink in and we'll deal with it in a future chapter. But what I do want to emphasize is that this whole chapter began by speaking in metaphorical terms about Yahweh planting a vineyard on on Zion and how religious and political and militant people destroyed that uh, vineyard and that the vineyard was attended by, of all people, his beloved, Dote. He planted it together with Dote. Uh, while Moshe brought us the Torah, uh, Dote explained it. He told us how to understand it, how to live it, how to apply it, how to observe it, how to benefit from it. It's all from uh, Dode. And you put all that into context, because this uh, the fifth chapter specifically condemns Paul. It specifically says that the Torah is the litmus test. Your perception of the Torah is going to determine whether or not you will be destroyed or, or live. Um, at this point, um, there isn't anybody else doing this. And so the banner that Yahweh lifted up, that was lifted up very far away from Israel at a very distant time, that uh, has been uh, mostly uh, read and to benefit uh, Gentiles, is a uh, yada yada and uh, an introduction to God mm-hmm. and observations for our time and questioning Paul and shattering myths and yada yada radio and the Torah Shabbat story that we collectively have uh, have created based upon translating Yahweh's word and have shared uh, to people whether it be on Facebook or uh, or on uh, YouTube or on on websites on radio programs you name it around the world and there's no other candidate now, I hope, because, by the way, I think this is very much like Yashiga 91. I think Yashiga 91 was written for me, and I think it was written for for all of you. Anyone who engages doing what Yahweh wants done, Psalm 91 applies. So you can say it applies to you personally. I can say it applies to me personally. I think this applies to us. But that doesn't mean that it's exclusive to us. No. There may be, and hopefully there will be. Others that come along, that uh, have uh, come to the same realization that, that Yahweh can list up their um, standard too. That would be a good thing. Would be a bad thing. Would be a wonderful thing. No. No, right no. now there isn't, but we hope we hope that will change. So it's a uh, really big, and some may say verbose banner, all these books and these shows. But yet it's an infinitesimally small when compared to the source from which it was derived. You know, all we're doing is waving what we have discovered up, hoping that those who are interested will go to the source and source and learn about Yahweh. Now in the fifteen years that we've been engaged in this mission, when compared to the six thousand years that have transpired since Adam and Chawa were expelled from the Garden of Eden, especially compared to the 14 billion years since Yahweh began creating the universe, it's a fairly short time 
by any measure are 15 years. And our task is finite. It will serve no purpose after Yahweh's return. And at that time, he will inscribe the, uh, the Torah inside of us, rendering our feeble efforts of translating his Torah completely obsolete. <laughs> now, as I shared in the uh, chapter devoted to the 91st Psalm, uh, I made a deal with God, one whose terms are reflected in this prophecy. I was willing to do the research, compile the findings, and be available to share what I had learned, so long as Yahweh took responsibility for lifting up, distributing the message. I would inscribe his words on the banner, and he would lift it up for the world to see. Even the means of broadcasting the message to the world is consistent with uh, what has been uh, made available to us, the Internet. Without it, relatively few would have heard my voice, your voices, or have had access to these books or your sites. As for the speed in which these words are shared, they are indeed transmitted at the speed of light. From the moment a chapter or show is complete, it is made available for everyone around the world to see. Now as we move to Yahweh's next prophetic statement, there is a, uh, an important, albeit subtle, difference between the great Isaiah scroll and the Mesoretic text. The reference to not growing weary is masculine singular in the Qumran scroll, the great Isaiah scroll, uh, and stands alone. Further, uh, AF, growing tired is a verb rather than an adjective. But the biggest difference is that the Mesoretic reads, no one among them, suggesting that there are many banners being lifted up instead of one. That's the implication of the Mesoretic. But according to Yashaya, there's only one. Based upon what follows, the banner which is lifted up for the world to see and the person assisting with it are shown as indistinguishable and inseparable, indicating that Yahweh is going to do as he has always done, convey his message through the most flawed of implements, a man. Each of the following references depict an individual who tirelessly engages without wavering, whose approach is so stimulating it can't be ignored, or so forceful it can't be ignored. I don't know what you would, would way you want to look at it, but it's hard to ignore. Yes. He is prepared for action and girded for battle, so much so that he has never been susceptible to attack. Nothing prevents him from going where he intends. And while that assessment is overly, uh, obviously, overly hyping this individual's preparation and, and performance, keep in mind that the individual isn't acting alone. Yah was engaged. And so are his Shabbat of Malak to ensure that the implement is used in the most far-reaching, appropriate, and productive manner. In other words, this person is simply willing, passionate, wholly committed, steadfast, and energetic as a tool. I want to underscore one thing here. I've said it so many times, but I'm, I want to make certain I say it again now. To be a tool used by Yahweh is not an honor. It's not an indication that that individual is special, good, smart, capable, uh, qualified, quite the opposite. I, well, as I'm reading the story of Gideon, I mean, what Gideon said and did... Come on. It's just, you just shake your head and say, come on, pal. What in the world is wrong with you? You know, you look at Dode. He he made more mistakes than he had hairs on his head. You look at Moshe. Oh, he was a stutterer. Yeah. Uh, everybody that God has chosen over time to work with, even Yasha, Yah, God takes him to heaven, and the first thing that he uh, says when Yahweh is obviously disappointed that there's no one at uh, at uh, the door that he has opened into his home, and Yahshua says, oh, I'm doomed. Uh, yeah, internalized. Uh, no, yeah. no, Hal, the creator God of the universe has just taken you as a, a three-dimensional construct and, uh, and enabled you to come into his home in heaven. And he's talking directly to you. You, of all people, are not doomed. <laughs> you don't need to worry. 
<laughs> you don't need to worry about this. Yeah, chill, but, chill out. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, chill out. Everybody that God has chosen to work with is deeply <laughs> flawed. <Funny. laughs> okay? So, so you know, as we talk about this banner being lifted up, and it's it's clearly us. Yeah. Don't don't get a big head on your shoulder. No, because, there ain't nothing special about it. Yeah, it's, God does not use impressive people. He just doesn't do it. Never has, never will. Never will. Okay, you know, the the most impressive individual at the time of uh, of Dode was not Dode. Was Shaul? No, Shaul. Head and shoulders above everybody else. Yeah. God didn't use him. You know, when even Midian is, or, or Gideon, excuse me, Gideon is uh, being approached, he says, God, why in the world would you come to me? I got nothing to offer. Yeah. Why would you come to me? It's a good start. But uh, beyond that, you're listening to me, aren't you? Oh, yeah, well, come to think of it. I got nobody else who's even wanting to listen to me. And, you know, and oh, sometimes, yeah. and maybe even often, that's the only qualification. You're willing to listen. Yeah, people would say, "Oh, I want to listen to what God is saying." No, they don't. They're no, not they don't. willing to invest the time to listen to what He has to say. And, and even as they begin the process, they don't like what He has to say, and so they give up and go do something else. I know, and you know, it's uh, the. Clear case is when Yahweh wants to engage you to uh, to convey His message, I mean, you better be willing to invest the time. I mean, he he is not going to be shy about uh, the uh, the time he uses, and so you better be ready. Without becoming weary devoid of a debilitating weakness and not prone to exhaustion, not requiring much rest and seldom growing tired. This is written in the call participle, active masculine singular. Also, without stumbling or wavering, never being brought down or failing as a result of a contradiction, never backtracking, never losing control, and therefore steadfast. Now, there, that's one that I would have thought that there were two occasions. One was Donut Man, and the uh, the other uh, was... Um, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah, was something else. I've forgotten who it was. But, yeah, but uh, you know, I um, I was short with the two people who were, who were promoting Christianity. And, uh, and um, um, did two things. Oh, in fact, there was one that uh, that I got uh, some people in the covenant didn't like at all. But uh, Moody uh, Moody Jeff, I think, was the fellow's name, and uh, and I, I went beyond just exposing and uh, and criticizing, all the way to mocking. And so you might say, well, with without stumbling or wavering, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that that ain't you, pal. Because you know you uh, you go to uh, to mocking. Well, uh, we will in a future show uh, tell the entire story of uh, of um, Elia and the uh, the referendum between Yahweh I love and the that Lord. story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I want to tell you, uh, we we can attest for There's a lot of mocking going on there. There's a lot of mocking, man. Yeah. That uh, Elia mocked the living bejesus out of him. He just absolutely Rude, crude, and uncouth. <laughs> well, just right in their face, and he didn't give them a moment. Mm-hmm. You know what's wrong with your God? Is he out going uh, to the bathroom? Mm-hmm. <laughs> out relieving himself? I mean, come on. So I have subsequently realized. And reading Dode's words and Elia's words and uh, and the like, mocking and uh, and overtly judging and criticizing is something that God does and wants us to do. Goes on to say, uh, and with him and it, 
no one becomes drowsy or falls asleep. Now, we've uh, written, what, 20,000 pages of material. But it, it, we're accused of a lot of things, mm-hmm. never of being boring. <laughs> No, you know, every time you write another chapter and dig up all this stuff and, and, and we all go play in the sandbox and start looking up everything, it's amazing. It just goes – I know there's the there's same themes over and over because that's the way Yahweh teaches, but yeah. my gosh, yeah. there are nuggets all over the place. All it's over just, the place, yeah. We're, we are unearthing just a, a little gold mine of, uh, of nuggets. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And it's yeah, – and like, you know, I, can har- I could hardly – Sit still, as I was t- I was translating the story of uh, of Elia and this referendum between uh, Yahweh and the Lord. And then when I got, I had no idea. I mean, I thought that the uh, the day of Gideon uh, would be just really. Bo- I had to I had to translate two entire chapters of Shaphat. I didn't expect to find anything other than to understand why the reference was there. <laughs> oh my! Every word was a treasure. Every word. Insights galore. Powerful insights. Additionally, the belt demonstrating that he is prepared and ready for action will not be loosened or undone. Around his waist and the connecting strap of his sandals shall not be torn or snapped. Now, this is the uh, the thing. If you looked at... at, uh, at Anyone Yahweh chooses to work with, he does consume their time. Now, they still have lives. They were all married. They all had lives. They had kids. They, uh, you know, they were active. But um, if you're willing to work with Yahweh and you're open to it, you, know, you better be prepared to go. Uh, there isn't anyone who works with Yahweh who's timid. I will tell you, Gideon... Yeah, he had a little uh, hitch in his giddy up there for a while, but uh, he finally got over it. As I said, he finally pulled up his big boy pants and was ready to roll. But uh, uh, that's the deal. It's, uh, there are uh, are a couple of things that I've recognized also, and I, I warn everyone all the time when uh, when uh, they write me, and that is don't don't share what you've come to know about Yahweh until you're prepared to do so. You need to be prepared. It takes time. You got to read. You got to learn. You got to translate. You have to verify. You have to think, and you have to go over sometimes the material four or five times before mm-hmm. uh, it literally becomes part of the fabric of your life, where it oozes out of you, where you go from knowing to retaining, and retaining to to understanding, and then you're in a position to convey it. And so, you need to uh, to gird yourself. You need to constantly be preparing, and you need to use it. If you're not using it, you can't retain it. You've got to be ready for action. Uh, Moshe was ready for action. Dode was ready for action. Elia, ready for action. You've got to be ready to go, and you've got to be willing to be prepared. This idea that uh, that you know you're going to wait on God and that somehow He is going to uh, use you, it's nonsense. You've got to be willing to do the work. And Now, don't want to give the impression, we've said this a lot of times too. Mm. Working with Yahweh is work. It takes a lot of time. It's the most enjoyable thing you can do. Work is fun. Work is rewarding. Uh, Kirk, you've, you're teaching less and studying more. You're working a lot yeah. on behalf of Yahweh. Have any regrets? No, absolutely not. If it, if it all got shut down, I would. I think I'd just go sit down and be and, and be sick. Yeah. This is fun. This is fun. I, w- I wish I had more energy. I mean, I can tell you that I'm older, and I wish I had more energy and could could do more. But uh, um, I'm gonna do something. You know, I find myself Whatever going is, to, uh, most nights uh, to. I can go to uh, nine o'clock before I start to wear down. And uh, I typically start most mornings after I exercise at about 8:30 in the morning, so it's uh, you know it's a 12-hour day. Yeah. And 
you know, I play golf, but I've never, I haven't played golf in two years. Yeah. I live on a golf well, course. You ought to get out and hit the ball I've, around every once in a while. Yeah, though. I haven't played in two years. You know, I, I, uh, I have an airplane, but I, I don't go on vacation. Yeah. You know, I, I may here, I haven't been on vacation in over a year. I may, you know, one of these days here, go on another Every day is a vacation. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, and you always got no, no issue with the, you doing that kind of stuff. But it's it's still, um, you invest the time yeah. doing so is fun. Oh yeah, it it uh, it just is. Now there is one frustrating part of it, like as I was uh, uh, two chapters of uh, of uh, Shafat to Judges six and seven to tell the story of uh, of Gideon, for example, and so. Uh, I decided I was going to tell the story differently. I wasn't just going to amplify the entire thing all the way through because I just wanted to carry the gist of the story. And, uh, and so, you know, I I went from the Hebrew and I, uh, I tried to correct the New American Standard along the way. And what I found out I was doing is even in a simple story, I was replacing seven out of ten words. You know, I would leave, he said, and I would leave... <laughs> Well, they did good to get that much right. Yeah, I I couldn't even leave things like uh, uh, with his hand because they would say with his power. Uh, You get frustrated because Mm -hmm. as I went through it, uh, I had to change 80% of it from what was uh, in the New American Standard that claims to be literal. Uh, And that part was... That part was frustrating. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, how in the world are people going to know the word of, of God if it's so badly misrepresented? To show the way to the benefits of the relationship, his arrows, his shots, and his missiles are piercing. And all of his bows shoot effectively to show the way. Poetic language. That's that's the, the only way that, I mean, is. As Yasha Yah is trying to recount this, um, <laughs> the language of the time, uh, you know, is, it, it means that that when uh, confronting things that are adversarial to Yahweh, and adversarial to our life in the covenant, that uh, uh, to show the way of the relationship, what he has to say is piercing. It cuts right through the muck. They're compelling arguments. And the system that he uses to deliver those instructive shots, powerful shots, those potent shots, um, are uh, is effective. Now, the next part of this is uh, um, it's uh, it, it speaks it's personal, I, I think, and and I, I realize that you have the opportunity to render this. Um, a different way if you choose. But I just rendered it as the words spoke to me. Mm-hmm. It says, his, his swift flying transport. It's from kook. A kook is a uh, an enjoyable swallow, a sleek and fla- fast bird. Now, there's people that want to translate it horses. I, I think it became horses because they were trying to figure out how in the world they could... Uh, Make the horses don't have land. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the Vulgate, but uh, swift fly. If you look at the at the primary meaning of kook, it's swift flying transport. So the swift flying transports landing gear. This is perka, curved feet of a large bird or winged creature. Now the curved feet of a large bird and winged creature. Pretty descriptive of landing gear. Mm-hmm. It says, Chasab is ingeniously crafted, is skillfully invented and planned, is machined, technically designed, devised and produced, is considered and imputed and thought to be straightforward and refined. Small, narrow, akin to knives which spark like vent and as hard as the, as on foes and hostile to opponents, from Jassar, vexing, testing, purging, refining, trending to shut people up, treating foes with enmity, frustrating them. 
So his swift flying transports landing gear is ingeniously crafted as straightforward and refined. And his propeller, the Gaul, serving as the round whirling device which makes his vehicle move. Round, turning implement for transportation akin to a paddle wheel. Rotating and swirling, wind-producing structure is like a whirlwind. Blows a strong and straight column of wind in a circular fashion. Now, I'm going to tell you that that's not how you're going to read it in the, uh, the King James. And this is clearly poetic language, but with a purpose. And while it could be describing his horse with sharp hooves, being skillfully invented with wheels turning like the wind or his swift flying transport replaced with ingeniously crafted landing gear which is straightforward and refined along with a propeller blowing a column of air behind it neither actually represent the intent of these words. The man engaged with Yahweh who assisted with the banner moves around and travels quickly and never loses his footing. The tools at his disposal were, cl- were skillfully invented and technical in nature. 90. And by deploying them, he stirs up a whirlwind of commotion, all designed to fulfill Yahweh's promise in the end. That's what the symbolic language means. And you can interpret it in terms of, of applying it in a real-world setting, however you choose. Now, this is, and this is why I enjoyed it, it's a fitting depiction of my TBM 850. It's a sleek and fast turboprop with a composite propeller and replete with very narrow retractable landing gear that have a knife edge on both sides of the, uh, of the round wheels. It may also be hinting at the fact that I've traveled by air to over 150 countries around the world. Without that exposure, without the lessons and perspective garnered by having flown around the world, I would not have been equipped and prepared to participate in this mission. It's also very limiting of the number of people that qualify. There are only 550,000 pilots in the United States. Only 150,000 of them hold an airline transport pilot certificate, as I do. Less than a tenth of 1% of the population, with only half of them owning their own airplane and a tenth of those flying a turboprop, you know, I'm a rare bird. So, once again, the purpose of this is to say that this individual engaged with Yahweh, who assisted with the banner, travels quickly, and yet never loses his footing. His tool, The tools at his disposal were skillfully invented and technical in nature, and by deploying them, he stirs up a whirlwind of commotion, all designed to fulfill Yahweh's promise in the end. And we're not quite done. There's a lot more uh, symbolism here in the, the next sta- statement. The young lion is, as you know, Kirk, is the symbol of mm-hmm. Yahuda, the family of Dod and uh, Yosha, the home of Jerusalem, Moriah, Zion, and the Covenant. And while I am an old lion, to be sure, my roar belies my age. And to the degree that my proclivities may matter, my prowess is in reconciling those willing to listen to Yah. Now, equipped with Yah's word, I have never lost a debate. It's not braggadocious, it's just a statement of fact. And no matter the threat, I've never been harmed. As for those whose message I challenge, those engaged in promoting the indefensible are always too far gone to be saved. They are challenged and tested not for their benefit, but instead on behalf of others not nearly so lost in the delusions of man. This is Yahshua 529. His roaring approaches like a great old lion. And so his thunderous roar is like the prowess of a young reconciling lion. He grasps hold of the beast being pursued, and he survives unharmed. 
and no one can defend I individually and then we collectively. Mohammed, mm-hmm. Paul, Akiba. Yeah, boy. I mean, we destroyed them in debate. And so his roaring, this is a loud and blaring guttural tone, approaches like a, a great old lion, a, a mighty and mature lion serving as the symbol of Yahuda. And we are really serving as a symbol of Yahuda to be related mm-hmm. to Yah, to relate to Yah. And so his thunderous roar, his loud shouts and mighty cry is like the prowess of a young reconciling lion. The, the young lion, the word used to de- depict it is kafir. It's the basis of kapuram. It means mm-hmm. to reconcile. He grasps hold of a chaz. He seizes, taking hold of the beast being pursued, the beast of Christianity, the beast of imperial Rome, the beast of, of Paul, the beast of Muhammad, the beast of Akiba, tearing up and destroying the prey. Yet he survives unharmed. He is spared any hardship, delivered from danger, escaping without trouble. Psalm 91. And no one can defend or save it, speaking of the beast, like Muhammad, Paul, and Akiba, imperial Rome, the United States. You know, you've destroyed those religions so completely that I, I went back and, and started reading their, because um, I have a pretty decent little library, and I, I went back and started reading their defense of uh, the Christian apologist or the defenders of the faith or whatever they want to call themselves. And 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 I broke it down about three things, and, I, I'm, and as I went over it, whether we ever shared it or not, but... When I, when I when I went over it, I said, and I've heard all these things, you know, over the years uh, as the defense yes. of Christianity, uh-huh. and, and it's, they're so lame. It's just unbelievable. They are. They are. Really I mean, lame. it's just. Uh, yeah. I don't know how. It's the worst. Uh, yeah, the worst that I ever encountered, Kirk, was mm-hmm. the uh, better part of a week. I spent on one of the most cathartic moments of my life. You know, I, I started off based upon the Dode uh, Down Under, our good friend uh, mm-hmm. in the land of, oh, yeah. the, uh, of the Kiwi, uh, oh, yeah, no that, uh, who said that a uh, number of radio hosts down there were uh, conveying the uh, the idea that uh, uh, Paul said that the Torah could not save. And uh, he asked me to see, was Paul mistranslated? Uh, or, you know, was, do we have, we you know, what what is it? That would cause them to uh, to say that sort of thing, and so I I tried to um, fix Paul. I tried mm-hmm. to fix Galatians, which was his first book, because he he cited the, all these pastors were citing Galatians as the uh, uh, Paul condemning the Torah, and I was doing my best to try to say, all right, he's not condemning the Torah, he's condemning the Talmud, and you know I was running out of ammunition for that, and that. Uh, mm-hmm. And then maybe he's just misunderstood, and <clears throat> and we'll correct the record. But when I got to the uh, the covenant that was affirmed on Sinai yeah. uh, in slaves, because it was made with Hagar, necessitating a new covenant, I uh, I lost it. I mean, I just yeah. at that point, I decided, how in the world can anyone have read this and uh, not realize that's a lie? Mm-hmm. And all the covenant on on that was Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, uh, that's the covenant in the Torah, and uh, and uh, Hagar was expressly excluded from it, as was her son. Yes. Uh, um, he said absolutely uh, Ish- not. Yeah, Ishmael, absolutely not. And so Paul's allegory is an absolute lie. Yeah. And so as I was uh, I was trying to figure out how do Christians get around that. You know, I even wrote, you know, the the guy that I was so close to and had written so many books with, uh, Ken. Yeah. And I said, how do you justify this? Oh, you know, it's allegorical. Well, no, it's not. It's just a lie. No. And uh, and so I, I spent a week reading hundreds upon hundreds of, uh, of Christians' uh, apologies for it. And all they came up with is, you know, Paul's right. <laughs> Paul uh, replaced the Torah. Yeah. Paul is the author of the New Covenant, and 
the gospel of grace has indeed replaced the Torah. And, and I said, well, you know, first of all, you can't do that by lying about the Torah. You can't win an argument if, you, if the basis of it start is a lie. lie. Yeah, you can't start with a lie if uh, that's the basis of your argument. And how in the hell do you justify a man contradicting God? Because God says exactly mm-hmm. the opposite. And how do you claim that, that, that this man was inspired by God to contradict God? If that were the case, then neither the man nor God could be trusted. Yeah, now just it was so obvious. That, but I, I did the same thing, uh, Kirk, that you did. I, uh, I went to read their apologies, and they were, they were, repul- they were as Amazing. bad as, as Paul's. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. It's just turned your stomach. I, I don't know how you can read that much drivel and come away. Um, I wish I had done it when I was a Christian. I mean, I read them, but I, I read them with no filter. You know, yeah, Kirk, the, uh, what they, happened to me is that um, is that you know, I, I got sucked into it and I got deeper and deeper and ordained ruling elder and Bible mm-hmm. study teacher and and I gave uh, uh, prayers at the uh, in mm-hmm. uh, large groups, uh, large commitment uh, addresses with uh, in, in the national senate and and uh, taught evangelism, led evangelism, and I, I got got deeper and deeper into it and uh, began to be concerned about the conflicts. And uh, then as I, I got in business and I was pulled you know, away to, to focus on supporting my family and building businesses, mm-hmm. those conflicts became serious concerns. You know, the, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the upright pole? Well, that how can you know if he's supposed to be God? How can God leave him? Uh, I was just there were the Trinity. I knew was Babylonian. I knew that Christmas and Easter were uh, were pagan concepts. Uh, you know, I knew that the Torah spoke about the seventh day, the sh- Shabbat, and Christians were worshiping on Sunday. I realized that a God who wants to be worshipped isn't worth knowing. Oh, uh, and yeah. there were so many just unanswerable questions. I knew his name couldn't be Jesus. The last name couldn't be Christ. Uh, and that the Trinity was Babylonian. That there was no evidence whatsoever that with billions of people praying about everything under the sun, that God had ever answered a single one of them. Yeah. Well, the football thing is really just laughable. I mean, like oh, that here about my... my yeah. And my shout out of the sand trap or your touchdown. I mean, come on, people. Oh yeah, every you know, I'm I'm watching these baseball games and everybody that uh, gets a hit or uh, or yeah. shuts up, strikes you, somebody Jesus. out, you know, does a yeah, points to the sky, uh, just like they do in football. It's almost unwatchable because of yeah. uh, of this uh, giving God credit for their uh, their strikeout, home run, or or touchdown. It's just it means revolting. Uh, you know, such a God that would get involved in uh, in siding with one person or another is not worth knowing. And so I was, and I was also fighting with how in the world could Paul say one thing and uh, and everything, mm-hmm. you know, and Yosha completely contradicted. So I'm, uh, uh, I went to, uh, I had a period where I was an agnostic. I went from devout Christian to agnostic, and uh, so it wasn't so hard for me to, uh, once I was seriously translating what he had to say, mm-hmm. uh, to embrace the truth. I had already given up on the lie. Yeah. And you had to be, uh, I, don't, I don't think you can come to Yahweh uh, or him approach you if you don't walk away. To some degree, you've got to be out of out of Babylon, at least in your brain, whether it's, and which is just like the story of Abraham. I mean, he was out of town; yeah. he wasn't in Ur anymore. Yeah. So, yeah. and and he Yahweh didn't say very much to him. Uh, so, yeah, he was, know, two, he's, he was two thirds of the way home. Yeah. yeah. By the time he was they, at Rome, uh, right? Uh, right. When he, yeah. Heron, yeah, so, yeah, yeah two thirds of the way home. Yeah, from Ur. <clears throat> so, um, you know, and and I know Terry and I, you know, her quicker than me walked away from. Uh, 
Yeah. Christianity and decided we'd find it in all the books we had. We've, it's got to be in there somewhere. And then she'd listen to yeah. you, and of course, on and on and yeah. on. But, yeah. uh, I don't think, yeah, you know, it goes to somebody who's deep into religion or politics or no. uh, the military and introduces himself while you're deep into it. You no, know, I don't think you right. can. I don't think you'll hear him. No. You won't, won't I don't have an think, open I don't, think, I don't think he's willing to do it. He's not willing to subject himself to that. So it's not. Yeah. He's not willing to do it, and uh, uh, and the person is not going to be receptive. So why why yeah. bother? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that is so stunning is when, you know, out of a nation probably of three or four million at the time, and uh, he always says that twenty two thousand is way too many. I, <laughs> you get, this is just too many people. Can't deal with this many people. Send them away. Boy, that ever. Uh, uh, destroys this myth that God wants to save everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't want to work with with uh, you know, a small percentage of them and kept on calling them until he got the 300. But even with the 300, he only talked to one of them. Yeah. You know, it was. Uh, it's pretty uh, obvious Gideon's when you saying, look at you know, it. You know, yeah. Follow me. Do what I do. Observe the Torah. Yeah. Everybody kind of missed that. Yeah, I don't think Gideon was the sharpest tool in the shed either. No. Uh, I, I didn't walk away with. Me. Yeah, I did not walk away with a a favorable impression of uh, of yeah. Gideon. I think Gideon's entire um, claim to fame in this particular story yeah. is that he was he was willing to listen up to a point, yeah. and he was willing to act. So long as God constantly proved Himself, and and I was a while well, the uh, the proof is a is a really fascinating story of what all the symbolism means and the uh, and the proof. Mm-hmm. I have never once, even well, I, I, would, I did when I was a Christian, but since I've come to know Yahweh, I have never once even thought for a second about asking God to prove Himself. Show me a sign, sort of thing. Yes, yeah, show me a sign. Yeah, Why no, would you I, do that? I don't need a sign. I've got his word. Uh, yeah, it's I obvious. Sign. I've got his word. Yes, I know. I mean, i got a thousand that's, signs right here. That's correct. They're, they're, every word is a sign. Oh. Uh, you know, he he proves his existence and uh, and that he is reliable uh, a million times over. So uh, why would you want a sign? It's insulting to say. Yeah, this is irrefutable. I don't care who you are. Go ahead. Take a shot. Yeah. Yeah, take a shot. Go ahead. And uh, Gideon, of course asked for a sign, and then he asked for another sign. And uh, and even then, uh, when the enemy was so numerous in the valley and, and Gideon got uh, uh, cold feet, oh, yeah. he had Gideon yeah, go down and, and, uh, and he said, I want you to go down there to the enemy and, and, and listen to what they have to say. And so God sta- staged a, uh, a conversation down there. About how uh, a uh, a loaf of uh, of barley uh, unleavened barley cake rolled down the uh, the hill and and then the guy interpreted the dream and said, "Well, this is Gideon, a man of, uh, of Yahweh, and he is uh, he's um, going to destroy our encampment, and God's given us into uh, into his hand." <laughs> and you say, "Okay, <laughs> dude, <laughs> you've been set up, man." <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> you've been set up. God is saying, time for you to put your big boy pants on. Let's go, boy. <laughs> yeah, come on. Yeah, and then Gideon originally comes back, and they, if you read every uh, English translation, he uh, before he he left the enemy camp, he uh, got down on his knee and and worshipped. Now, of course, no. just before the test was of who's not going to go with him is anybody on their knees, and he's still in the <laughs> enemy <laughs> camp. He ain't going to be worshiping, and it's uh, uh, it's uh. Uh, cha'a, the uh, the, uh, the word that uh, means that he responded verbally. Mm-hmm. He made a declaration. Well, he immediately goes, it leaves the uh, the camp, it says. He arrives back at uh, the top of the hill where the uh, uh, Israelites are, the 300 Israelites. And uh, he immediately makes an announcement. He says, uh, yeah, always confirmed that he's going to uh, do what he, uh, he promised. And so uh, let's get going. It's time to stand up and... Uh, and go and uh, and you know here's what we're going to do. We're gonna take our shofars and we're going to take our tiki torches, 
<laughs> in a story of 50,000. Why not? Yeah, when, uh, well, it, yeah, many yeah, many. Well, yeah, I don't even say how many there were. Too many to yeah. count. And then yeah. uh, we're going to uh, blow our horns and uh, and shatter our tiki torches, and they're all going to flee. And then, yeah, I was going to deal with them. Yeah, so it, it's quite the story. Fun stuff. All right, well, we have actually finished Yasha Ya uh, uh, 5. That is the, uh, I think that's the end of the, uh, that's the end of the chapter. So uh, even on this program now, we'll be able to go back to, I think it's 10, where we are uh, talking about the history of uh, translations. Hopefully Scott will be back in. Scott had a marvelous time down there in Austin. Um, Pretty good. Yeah, really a marvelous time. I, it, it's, um, and uh, um, the amazing thing, too, is that Alex Jones, who was really, really nice to him and uh, gave him an enormous amount of time, actually asked Scott, you know, what would you recommend? But based on what you know so far, what am I doing wrong? What would you recommend uh, I uh, do going forward? And uh, Scott laid it on. I mean, just said everything that, you uh you'd want him to say and uh Alex Jones said uh you know you're right. Uh, that's what I needed to hear. And that's why I want you here. I don't want uh, uh I don't want you to ever be afraid to tell me what you really think. That's what I need to hear. Well, wow. so it was, uh, it was a really really good meeting. So uh, anyway, we'll have Scott uh in um in Minnesota. Uh, for another few months, and, and uh, I don't know how we'll uh, we'll work from there, but uh, we know that uh, Alex Jones has uh, a bigger, better setup than does GCN, and and so that observation show it doesn't affect this show, but the observation show uh, that's how it's uh, mm-hmm. uh, how it's manifest, and so we should be able to continue it there. But if we don't. Yeah, yeah, but we can we can du- we can double up on Yada Yada Radio on yeah. BTR. I, you know, I pay for the their uh, their top uh, uh, fee so that we can uh, we can use it whenever we want to use it. So we can just have a second one of those, and we'll figure out a way to uh, uh, okay. to get it, Put it all together. published sure. on the various sites, on the YouTube, and and on the various websites. All right. Well, that's uh, that's a wrap for uh, this evening. Timing worked out well for us. Perfectly. Yeah, and you know, I hope that um, people aren't uh, too blown away by the thought that you know, here's uh, Yasha Yani may have been talking about us, but and if he's not talking about us, that's just fine. But yeah. I sure as heck like to know he's talking about. <laughs> he's talking about us. Yeah, I think he's talking about us. <laughs> That's okay. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, my friends, are we going to call it a night? And then, uh, yeah, and by the way, you know, for all we have mm-hmm. been doing and the yeah. the profound insights that we've uncovered and the th- tens of thousands of pages we have translated and commented on, mm-hmm. uh, yes. well, that's pretty significant, um, particularly in a world where there have gone centuries without a single person. Right. That Yahweh could communicate through, you would expect that there would be, you know, some reference, some notice. Mm-hmm. And my guess this isn't the only one. It's just not an insignificant event. It certainly isn't for my life. No. I mean, just and 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 the handful of people that I get a chance to talk to and know personally, um, this is like monumental. And and yeah, it's against I, all odds. You're you're against everything. Right. We're against the right. entire world. Uh, so, so this this is. I don't know how, how else I could say how significant it is. Yeah. And I'm sorry it's so, so few. Yeah. But because it's so clear. That's, that's the way so it is. Wonderful. Yeah. So right. So obvious. Yeah. yeah. If it wasn't for the fact that most people are indoctrinated by religion or improperly educated and they've lost their ability to exercise good judgment, everyone mm-hmm. that heard this would just. You know, instantly embrace Yahweh and his covenant. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that they have not uh, uh, just touched it. That Only proves what Yahweh said. The fallen said. condition of man. Yeah, the fallen condition of man. Mm-hmm. Time of darkness. 
All right, fellas. <clears throat> stay safe. Stay uh, yeah. stay uh, content. We'll uh, we'll do this again next week. Yes. Was that uh, your, your dog? Was that your dog barking in the background, or was that uh, James yours? It's got to be James's. Okay. Mine's downstairs. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, good night. All right, guys. Enjoyed it immensely. Yeah. Take care, oh, by the way, you know, I, I, I am a Dodger fan, one of the few teams yeah. I actually follow, and uh, they're yeah. in the World Series, you know? I don't oh, know they won, yeah, that's, right. that's right. That's yeah. Right. You don't follow yeah. baseball much? Uh, no, I used to follow I used to follow the uh, Dodgers uh, back when they were, uh, you know, and Kurt Gibson and all those guys. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. They went to San Diego yeah. and also uh-huh. it, I kind of lost uh, <clears throat> for a while. I've kind of been disinterested, but... Uh, because you know, you know, it takes so long for them to come back. As it takes so many many people, they have to recruit or bring up through their farm program. Oh, I know. And, yeah, you know, 1988, just, uh, the last time that they uh, they won yeah, a World a long Series time. or even in a World long Series. Time. Yeah, I was mm-hmm. over in China at the time. I remember that I, no, I missed I the remember entire series. That was I was in, yeah, I was in I was in China. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right after uh, our, both of our first two sons were born, and I'm over in. Uh, in China, of all places. Uh, well, won't be in China this time. In fact, that's the last ball game I actually physically went to see was uh, the Dodgers over those years. You know, we had some people had a, had tickets all the time, and they would invite us. So, and, and yeah, I've been to a hundred Dodger games. So yeah, I've seen uh, my share. Both of my sons are Dodger fans. Oh. So yeah, it's fun. And my university gets to play Notre Dame this weekend. Yeah, oh, I'm I'm so pulling informed. Yeah, I am too. I, every time somebody plays Notre Dame, I pull for them. Yeah, I know. I, my uh, my favorite team I still have every the tape of Alabama is, uh, destroying them. You know, yeah, it's and USC the, uh, and whoever play who's ever playing Notre yeah. Dame. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know y'all would so, not get involved, but it's great fun oh, to watch. I know, I know. I know. It's still fun to watch. I'm pulling for though. Yeah, yeah, just uh, oh, so opposed to Roman Catholicism. Yeah. Yep. All right. Hey, you know, it's, what's interesting is that the last time they actually did a survey of the number of mm-hmm. Catholics on USC's team versus Notre Dame's team, there were twice as many Catholics on Notre on USC's team as Notre Dame's. That that doesn't uh, <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. The uh, the uh, the Catholic schools, I guess, is because they can they can recruit basically in high school because they can take them. For whatever oh, they so reason, many, they can go yeah, to Catholic religious school, schools, right. so you don't you're, right. you're not zoned by you have to stay in your geographic area. So you can they can yeah. just. I saw one my of the games, is uh, that, that second only to Boston that uh, Cincinnati, where mm-hmm. I'm living now, has yeah. the highest percentage of Roman Catholics. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. And we're inundated with Muslims, just inundated. But that's because yeah. of Procter and Gamble being here and worldwide, and they have so many Muslims in their headquarters. Really? We just uh, we have uh, just a mile away the uh, Islamic the Society Center of Ohio. Oh, it's huge mosque right on the freeway. It makes me want to puke every time I drive by it. Yeah. Yeah, two doors down, I have a Muslim family. Yeah, well, we have one in that neighborhood, and, and uh, yeah. And, yep. you know, the thing is just so irritating to me is that Muhammad was a terrorist. He was a pedophile. He was a rapist. He was a mass murderer. The Quran is the worst book ever written. And Muslims perpetrate 99.9% of the world's terrorist acts. Yeah. And you say, and, how in the world could you be promoting that religion? in a free country where you have the opportunity to walk away from it without being killed. It's staggering, isn't it? Staggering. I mean, just... Yeah. just uh, I mean, I that just one little it. list, and, and people go... And and nobody seems to know it. Because I no. mentioned that, and they say, well, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if he comes up, I tell them, this is, this is Muhammad, according yeah. to Muhammad, according to the Quran. According to Muhammad. Read it yourself. I can yeah, give it to you in English if you like. Right. And they just go. Terrorists led 75 terrorist raids in 10 years. Yeah. Pedophile, mass murderer, slave trader. Yeah. I mean, what do you want? Right. Rapist. Well, right. What do you? What is it you? Why are you not angry? Can who, stand uh, women. Who admitted twice that he was demon possessed? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Why would you respect something like that? Why would you tolerate it? Why? Yeah. Just. 
sec. All right, my friend. You have a uh, good evening. Best to Terry. Yes, indeed. Good evening. Thank you.